we want to welcome all of you. Um, so let's practice unmuting our microphones in the lower left corner. If you want to unmute yourself and just wave and say hi, we can. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Nice to see everyone. Um, I wanted to introduce myself, Nicole Lezen, and I'm one of the co-facilitators along with Nicole Young. Hello. Many of you know of the uh, core investments process, which is a collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well being for everyone in our county across the lifespan. We've been able to do this with many different partners from local government, philanthropy, nonprofits, and community groups, many of whom are on the call today. And we're particularly grateful to our steering committee that has helped guide all this work and two of the members who are here speaking. Um, representing the arts and education sectors today, and we'll introduce them in just a moment. Some of you may have participated in prior core events, such as uh, trainings. We did, we did a bunch of um, peer learning circles with small groups last year, larger groups that we are calling core conversations. All of those have been ways that we've been trying to build a shared vision and common goals and skills and capacity among all of us, uh, funders, policymakers, service providers, and community members working together to make our community safer and healthier for everyone. That was all before the uh, coronavirus crisis, and a lot of the things that we've been focused on are really heightened by this crisis, particularly the idea of achieving equitable health and well being for everyone. So, in this environment, we wanted to keep going with our training and capacity building. And we're in the early stages of trying to pull all of those offerings together into something that's more, um, more formal that we're calling the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact, or the Core Institute for short. So these core coffee chats are part of that. And we're trying to hold them weekly. We've done a mix, as some of you know, of practical how-to sorts of things, like how to use Zoom, which clearly we're all still learning, we along with you. And also more um, targeted topics and reflections, like the discussion today and another one we had last week. And we'll tell you more about what we have planned for next week as we go along. So for now, um, we'd like to ask everyone to introduce yourselves in the chat box. So for those of you who haven't done so yet, the chat is a little uh, speaker uh, bubble icon at the bottom of your screens, or maybe if you have to hover to show it on an, um, on an iPad or other systems. But if you click on that, you should get a chat box opening up and you can see that you can share a, a comment with everyone or with Nicole Young, or with me as the co-host. If you're having technical difficulties, go ahead and contact Nicole Young and she will do her best to try to field your question as we're going along. But for now, go ahead and get into the, the chat box and it, just let us know where you're from, your organization. And for those of you who weren't here at the very first few minutes, Carolyn Coleman had suggested you can also change your name um, to include your organization by hovering over your name in the participant box. There's a, a box that says more and that'll let you do that. But if you can't do that, don't worry about it. We just want to know a little bit about who's here. So thanks. Seeing a lot of familiar names scroll by and some new ones as well. So we appreciate that. It looks like we've got about 50 of us all together right now, which is great. So one of the features of Zoom is that we can do quick little polls. And so Nicole and I thought that we would do what we're going to call a, a quarantine quiz just to get started here. So not to intrude too much into people's personal lives, but let us know, are you wearing pants today? <laughs> you can see some various options there. And I'm going to read the options out loud because on the recording, of this session, the oh, poll itself won't appear. So the options are uh, yes, and they still fit. Or yes, if sweatpants, leggings, and PJs count as pants. Not pants, but something else loose and comfy. Uh, no, and remind me to turn off my video camera. Or <laughs> none of your business. <laughs> so 
So we're seeing um, most everyone has answered the poll. Still a few people left either checking or trying to decide what <laughs> which of these options best reflects what they are wearing or not wearing. Well, and I see Carol in the chat saying jeans today. That constitutes an upgrade for, for you, you know. Uh, and Elisa says same ones as yesterday, which <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> I think a lot of us could probably relate to. I'm actually kind of jealous of the people who are saying yes, and they still fit. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give like three more seconds before I end the poll. Three, two, one. Okay. And now you can see the results. Fairly even split. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks for indulging us. All right, we'll, we'll move on from that more lighthearted thing to more serious fare. So one of the reasons we wanted to have this chat today is that like many different aspects of our lives, our relationships to education and arts have been altered by the COVID-19 crisis. And we're really fortunate to have leaders from each of those sectors with us today. Dr. Ferris Sabah, who's the County Superintendent of Schools, and Jim Brown, the Executive Director of Arts Council, Santa Cruz County. So they're gonna talk to you uh, about how they're responding to some of the immediate needs presented by COVID-19 and answer some of your questions. And Ferris and Jim, as I mentioned earlier, are both members of core steering committee, so we're personally grateful to them for that um, helpful guidance as well as participating in this chat. So they're both really busy and we're grateful that they've taken time out of their schedules and all of the demands on them. And we know many of you are too, so we wanna use this time to really hear from them and try to field some of your questions. But we're also interested as we go forward with these coffee chats and other conversations about your ideas about how we can all respond collectively to turn this crisis into an opportunity to build the kinds of resilient, inclusive and equi equitable communities that have been our goal before, during and after this crisis. So these two sectors, arts and education, we think of as a really important bridge between our current situation and a better future. So, Let's go ahead and hear from our speakers today. We'll hear from Ferris first, and then from Jim. And after each of their presentations, you'll get to ask questions using the chat function. Nicole and I will try to highlight questions from that as best we can. And if there are any we happen to not get to today, we'll, we'll collect those and we'll see what we can do about responding to them afterwards. Nicole, would you like to introduce Ferris for the group? Yeah, I, I'm um, super happy to actually say a few words about Ferris. I've had the privilege of getting to work with him in many different uh, facets and I'm really grateful, like Nicole Lesson said, that you made the time to be here with us today, Ferris. I know that uh, I'm sure you've had your hands in a million different things, um, but that's really helpful and valuable to be able to hear how the education system is responding to COVID-19. Um, and I know just from, you know, my own experience working with Ferris that um, he personally and the County Office of Education as a whole um, really deeply believe in educational equity and have really made that um, commitment to centering equity in their new strategic plan. And so I think we will see and hear how that's playing out and uh, in in real time uh, as Ferris talks to us today. And, you know, as a parent of a, a high school student myself here locally, I've also just really appreciated how proactive and clear the communication has been coming from the county office and from school districts. And um, so just wanted to preface that by, you know, Ferris's presentation by saying, you know, we know that there are probably some bright spots to highlight in terms of how this crisis has brought people together in different ways um, and also acknowledge that there are still a lot of equity challenges that we're all facing and so hope that you also view all of us Ferris as helpers and people to uh, lean on in terms of helping solve some of those challenges. Um, so I'm going to turn over to you and just kind of ask you to you know, tell us more about you know how COVID-19 is impacting the education system and how you're all responding. Thank you so much. 
<laughs> Nicole, Nicole, it's uh, it's really a pleasure to be here to join you today. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear oh, you. Oh, wonderful. Um, I'm going to share my screen and uh, um, uh, start. Uh, can everybody see the, the the slide deck? Yes. All right, great. So um, before I get started, I did I did want to just uh, thank you for the opportunity and 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 help us with uh, with maintaining our focus on equity. You know, one of the one of the the silver linings that we've experienced through this this uh, at this pandemic has been the collaborative nature of our relationship with all of the the superintendents across the county coming together and really focusing on on having a, a consistent message to the communities to really uh, provide as much support as possible and that's been one of the uh, one wonderful thing that's come from this is just a, a really great collaboration with all with all of the school districts with charter schools with private schools and everybody focused kind of all in on 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 thinking about how to support students uh, across the county I was I've uh, we've talked about the agenda we have about 15 minutes for you for me to share just a little bit about how the educational system has pivoted to uh, to address the challenges that we're <coughs> facing with COVID-19 then we'll have about five minutes to um, uh, to have questions and answers uh, if it's okay I'll, I'll ask uh, Nicole or and Nicole if, if they could monitor the chat the chat for me so that uh, questions come up either if they're pertinent in the middle and that's great and if, if we can wait till the end that's great as well so I just wanted to start with a bit of a timeline uh, it's such it's kind of crazy when you think about how we usually think of time and how much time we usually have to plan for things uh, you know the the emergency the state emergency was declared on March 4th and we the, all of the all 10 super uh, district superintendents with the county house of education sent out a notification on march 12th to close schools for march 16th and so you know uh my just my wife and i were talking about that when i went out we went out to dinner on my birthday on march 6th that was the last time we were actually sat down in a restaurant you know this is just a few weeks that that things have 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 really rattled things and shaken shaken our our society and i don't have to all of you of course are, are very aware of of how quickly this has moved but we also felt like it was important for the school system uh, to 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 move quickly as well we were the first county in the state to my knowledge that actually uh, made the decision to to close schools there had been other districts that had already large districts such as San Francisco Unified uh, but but we were the the first county that together all all ten school districts uh, came together and, and made that decision and um, and I think that uh, I, I think that that was in recognition of how closely we were working with our public health, uh, 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 our public health officer, as well as a recognition of the science behind and kind of a recognition of the importance of, of schools being a space that 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 could uh, contribute to transmission and, and really need to needed to be to to be modified. So you'll see on the left side of this slide I, we talk about the transition to essential services, and that's you know we're, we're continuing to provide. Uh, uh, free and reduced lunch services across the county. There's uh, almost 40 locations where students are able to pick up lunches. This, the district superintendents were amazing, supporting any young person, regardless of their age, regardless of what school they come from, being able to access uh, at any of the locations in the county. Uh, Pajaro Valley and Five School District went above and beyond and provide, provided food for families. Um, and of course, we heard about, you're aware of, of many of the nonprofits like Second Harvest Food Bank and Gray Bears and other organizations that have been helping. And so really a, a community approach to providing those, the, the, the basic uh, essential services. What we defined as essential services as an educational community, uh, one is uh, we define things like uh, uh, cleaning and, and disinfecting and sanitizing our schools as, as an essential service, uh, the, the nutrition services, um, you know, of course, educational services, distance learning, and then institutional continuity, which would be things like payroll and HR and all the things to, to keep the system going and, and, and in place. And there's a lot of, uh, we had to make a list of the people that we identified as essential, as essential employees. And at that point, basically, everybody started working from home. We started making that transition. And at that point, also, uh, some of the, some people 
like our, our food service workers, our, our some, some of our, our administrators, our custodial staff continue to, to work uh, from, from, from locations at, at school sites and in, in, in district locations. And on March 16th, we extended the closure to April 10th, and on March 25th, we extended it to May 5th. And then, of course, on April 1st, we announced uh, all the district superintendents and our, our public health officer that we were going to be continuing through the end of the school year. And that came with, with guidance from some leadership, like Tony Thurman at the state level, as well as the governor, who had been saying that we weren't going to be uh, making any, any it, was, it was not likely that schools were going to be open uh, through the end of the school year. Once we made that announcement, the focus really has been on grading and graduation. Uh, a focus from parents, from students, especially students in high school, students who are going to graduate. And we've been working very hard to define how students are going to be able to, to complete the fourth quarter, how, what grades are we going to give them, what is graduation going to look like. Um, and so uh, these are some of the things we've been facing. I wanted to share a quote from you, and this came from Stanford University's Faculty Senate, and they shared that um, educational equity is a key consideration in the proposed changes. Online learning exacerbates the inequities of students experience and those who are most affected by the COVID-19 crisis uh, may face serious barriers to academic success. And I think that you know, this, this group and uh, the core team really is focused on equity and, it's, and how how all of these organizations and school districts across the county have made a commitment to address and uh, disrupt equity and equitable, uh, disrupt inequity and uh, inequitable practices across the county. And I think that these kinds of situations, what they do is in, in many cases, they make those inequities more apparent. They expose them even more. And unfortunately, many of our most vulnerable youth and our, our families with, with the highest challenges that are, are are in a more difficult situation. Some of the challenges that we're seeing that have, have really been exposed from our point of view, and we're talking about 40,000 students across the county, uh, parents, uh, family members, um, the, our students and our families are experiencing, as, as, as many of you know, uh, food and financial insecurity. Uh, many folks who've lost their livelihood um, have uh, continued to, to struggle with housing and are experiencing homelessness. We have uh, many families that are mixed status um, and are fearful to be able to access available resources that are available to them and, and um, in, 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 in this environment of this, uh, that the federal government has, has created for our families. We've also experienced many of our students when we're transitioning to distance learning, we recognize that about 18% of our students across the county don't have access to a device and high-speed internet. And, um, and there's many reasons for that, but, but the, the basic reason, and it's, it's families are unable to afford um, high-speed internet. And so we've been working with our school districts and other partners to provide free opportunities for them. Our, many uh, the school districts um, have been giving out hotspots uh, I think uh, Pajaro Valley Five School District gave out over a thousand hotspots just in the last couple of weeks. Um, we're, we're handing out hotspots at the COE, uh, Santa Cruz City Schools, trying to get as many of the families connected and then providing devices such as Chromebooks uh, at home so that students are able to participate in this distance learning. But that 15 to 18 percent, I think we're, we'd be able to to eat into that, 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 that number of students, but it, many of the solutions are also temporary. And so, uh, you know, these free offerings by our, the internet service providers, many of them are for three months, for two months. And so after that, the expectation is that these will be paying customers and that's not necessarily the case. Another challenge that we're, we're, uh, we're experiencing related to equity is, is mental health challenges for, for our students and, and their families. Uh, of course, the situation is, is increasing isolation. And so many of the challenges students who are already facing um, are, have, are, are enhanced and, um, and made even more impactful. Uh, students experiencing anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation. And so there's been a lot of our, our support systems have, have needed to change. Pajaro Valley Prevention Student Assistance is still providing some crisis support on site. And they're and providing telehealth and um, and many of our service providers are, are are moved into that, but when I look at the difference there, um, uh, Santa Cruz the, the Santa, Santa Cruz Medical Clinic, my understanding is that they've 
been able to move om, up to almost 90% of their appointments to telehealth. Um, whereas a salud para la gente, it looks closer to 40%. And so the fact that in Watsonville and in, in, our, in areas where there is lower, lower income families, the ability for them to be able to access the comfort level with the technology, the comfort level with just that, that very, art, very different and artificial type of virtual communication is leading to folks being unable to access many of the services that are available. Another challenge, of course, is our, the unique needs that students have. Uh, students um, who speak a language other than English, a language other than Spanish. Many of our, our Mixteco uh, families are feeling uh, like they're not able to access many of the resources. Of course, students with unique and special needs or special education students. Uh, imagine working with a, a moderate, severe student, some of our, our most medically fragile students, and trying to take an IEP, their, their educational plan, and figure out how you're going to deliver services uh, through Zoom. Uh, for those students. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling and it's, it's something that we're working really hard to do, but it's extremely difficult. And the concerns we have, of course, are, you know, if we can't, we can't be with our students, we can't uh, provide those direct services, how are we able to provide them a free and public education as, as the law requires and, and they deserve? Um, another area of, uh, I'd like to share with you is that as we've been getting a lot of feedback from our community, we're hearing a lot about the pressure people are feeling and it kind of is related to mental health but a lot of students parents teachers are feeling overwhelmed in this environment that the that the expectation for teachers to to transition to a distance learning environment and to be able to make contact with all their students some of our high school teachers have 160 students that they're they're trying to stay connected with parents feeling like their role has now changed many of them working from home and they're expected to provide support for their kids students who are who are not getting the support that they need there's so much pressure for them to adapt to that i think is making it extremely difficult for our families to be able to and um and i think that 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 pressure is is going to lead to continues to lead to students not participating uh students uh, parents feeling disenfranchised and feeling disconnected teachers uh feeling unable to connect with their students and and um and i think a lot of that is is, is leading to some of the, the challenges and then finally i'd like to share of course that we are seeing an increase uh in our county and but across the country in reports of of domestic violence and physical and sexual abuse it is a concern we have, of course. I think that the, the, the isolation that, is, that is, is occurring is making it more difficult to be able to intervene and, and, and support uh, our families. And so um, this is something that is of great concern to us. So overall, these challenges really are sobering and, and, and really are, are, uh, tell us that we cannot rely on, on you know, uh, how we how we've done business in the past or or a simple uh, math transition to we're just going to do it through zoom that that we really have to be thinking differently and so we, we've been working hard on creating um, different ways of responding to the needs of our community so I'd like to share a little bit about what that looks like for us and um, and uh, Nicole can you give me a time check you've got about two more minutes oh my gosh okay so we developed a, a uh, comprehensive, uh, I don't know if comprehensive is the right word, but an approach to, to provide a response. You'll see on the left side here, and that's what I'll focus on, um, health and safety, continuity of education, support services, maintenance and operations, human resources, and financial impacts. And really the idea is to, to work with teams of people, create a, a consistent response planning uh, team work with the pink box here, which is the public health, local and county authorities, and then interface with our superintendents, our charter schools, our private schools, our preschools and childcare providers to send out some consistent messaging to our to our community. And that's worked really well. People have really appreciated the consistency. And I think that uh, for the most part, you know, uh, having a consistent message signed by all 10 uh, district superintendents in the county office of education, charter schools sending out similar if not the same letters um, to their families that message of that we are working together that we are a single unit is really is, has been really useful i wanted to share with you also some of the things that we're doing as teachers are, are reaching out to families which is this green uh, uh, we've been also creating um, working to help create this unable to contact process and all the school districts are doing their own version of this but the idea is that if a teacher 
or another staff member identifies a student as unable to contact, that we're, we're doing everything we can uh, to, to reach out to, to, to students and, and their emergency contacts in a variety of different ways. And also creating a, a support system uh, so that uh, teachers can help identify students who have basic needs, social emotional support or additional ed, ed supports, and that there's a feedback loop that brings it back to, to teachers. And the idea is, is that these teams are working together um, to, to provide support so that students are, are, one, we're connecting with them, we know they're safe, we know they're healthy, and we're and, and hopefully ready to learn. I put it in that order though. It's really about making sure we're connecting with our students and our, our, our um, some of the challenges that we're facing for the future, you know, not having an unknown timeline is makes it difficult to plan. We're assuming that we're going to be back in session at the beginning of the fall, but that could obviously change. Um, we're concerned about student academic deficits, and so we're working really hard to get students connected, but also plan for when they return face to face. Um, some students are going to be difficult to locate. We've, we're hearing about students who are off the grid or, or working in the field to support their families. Getting them back into the educational system will be a challenge. A lot of services, many of the people uh, who are a part of this meeting are, are, are experiencing some big challenges when it comes to finances and, um, and the continuing challenges of the future, I think, could result in a lot of services disappearing. Some of our highest needs at, uh, Special ed students go to private programs, and many of those are sharing with us that if they don't, that, that they're likely not to be around in the fall if things continue this way. Um, we anticipate big budget cuts for 2020, 2021, uh, and because of the because economy has has is in such bad shape, and so that's where we have to where the issue of equity and being being standing on equity as a core value for us and making decisions when we're having to make reductions that to me is where we show our true colors and that's where i think the conversation about making sure that we are standing up for the most vulnerable students and families is, is, is going to come out because where we cut and where we make those reductions is, is going to have is is you know going to have a is going to really show what our priorities are. And in the past, many times the first the first per folks to go were counselors, um, nurses. You know those those support positions that are key and extremely important for our most vulnerable youth. And um, and then one of the one of the areas that we're working on with with our district partners and and um, with agencies uh, is really looking at how to eliminate the digital divide. We see connectivity as as access to a lot of resources, not just the educational component. And we feel like if we're able to provide the support and the resources for families to connect, we're gonna be able to help uh, families be able to access a lot more resources and, and, and overcome many of the equity challenges that, we, that I talked about earlier. Thanks, Ferris. We have a, a number of questions coming up in the chat. Um, so some of which you addressed during your presentation about the equitable distribution of tools like the Chromebooks and hotspots. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about support for parents that are coming from the districts, especially some of the families you mentioned who may not speak English or Spanish or may not have a formal education and are now being asked to basically monitor their children's education without resources of their own? So so the big the big challenge in my mind is that um, we're we're the underlying way of connecting with our families right now is either through paper packets or connecting with students I should say is with paper packets or internet connectivity, and almost all the resources that we have available um, are are done through the virtual you know through phone through phone calls or through uh, internet connectivity. And so I, in my mind, there's an infrastructure challenge here that to be able to connect with those families on top of the cultural uh, proficiency challenges and the language challenges and all those other pieces. If we're not able to connect with, with families uh, in the first place, then we're not able to, to deliver any kind of information, much less uh, uh, um, support. And so I think that that some of the, the resources that are available, a lot of the folks, if you, you look at what, what Pajar Valley's Unified School District is doing in terms of the resources to our Misteco speaking families, for example, they're, they're working to reach out to them, to connect with them and make sure that they, they continue that, those, those, those relationships in by phone and, and, making, and making contact with them. Um, and I think that that's like the first layer. So if I think of it in, in a layered plan, 
being able to help bring our families um, to become more comfortable with this with this uh, way of connecting, making sure that they have the resources and the abilities to be able to to access a telehealth uh, conversation, for example, and feel comfortable talking to their medical doctor uh, through that that virtual uh, way is, is going to be something that's going to take us some time to build up. But it is something that I think that we're feeling a lot of pressure to, to move forward to uh, right now. And, and we've done other things. We're partnering with different agencies to, uh, that are providing support groups for, for, for parents to be able to talk about their experiences and be able to support each other. Um, and I think that, again, that, that, that presumes that you have the internet connectivity and the skills to be able to do that. So, so I think that digital divide is, is really limiting our ability to be able to provide uh, more services in this, in, in, in this modality, in this, in this context. Okay, thanks Ferris. We have several more questions that we're just gonna have to hold for now. Just, we wanna hear from Jen as well. We may be able to circle back to some of the questions for Ferris um, and some apply to both Jim and Ferris at the end, but we will, we will keep monitoring those questions and find a way to get responses to you. And we're also gonna ask Ferris and Jim to share their slides so we can share those with you. So for those of you who asked about that. And I, and I would be happy just to, I would be happy if we put these on a, on a Google sheet to answer them and share them with the group, so. Oh, fantastic. Okay, thanks for that. I'm going to introduce Jim briefly. Many of you already know Jim Brown um, from a decade on and off with the Arts Council, but also from prior work with the Diversity Center and the Community Foundation. So somebody who really knows the nonprofit world in our county is also somebody who really lives the example of arts uh, being a life-changing personal and professional um, role. And so many of us turn to the arts either for expression or solace or healing, but the fact is that, in, as he'll uh, touch on in, in his presentation, the arts are woven into our lives and our economy here in ways that are sometimes uh, less visible, but but really crucial. And so we're gonna hear from Jim about how the COVID-19 um, crisis has affected arts organizations in our county and, and what kinds of things he sees moving forward. And again, we'd, we'd love to hear your questions um, through the chat, even if we can't get to all of them today. So Jim, I'm gonna share my screen for your slides and just let me know when you'd like to move them forward. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, and yeah, just my uh, my thanks to the Nicoles as well for including the uh, including the arts in these conversations. It just feels so critical that we uh, that we pull together and connect with each other at these times when we're isolating socially. Um, so I just really want to appreciate what they're doing. Um, I've been participating in a number of calls, both with uh, with local funders and with nonprofit leaders across a number of sectors. And it really is, and just listening to Ferris talk about the work that they're doing, it is inspiring to work with so many people thinking and working hard to reconnect um, and respond to this crisis and to mitigate the impact um, and to support those most in need. Uh, I got to admit on a personal level that sometimes on those calls, I find myself questioning why I'm there. Uh, in a crisis like this, it's easy to feel like the arts are superfluous and a luxury. Um, but then you hear stories like we've probably all heard on the news about people singing from their balconies in it Italy and you see people sharing the poetry they're writing uh, in their solitude and artists sharing creative projects that you can do at home with your kids. Um, and I think about the things that we do in our free time, um, you know, or in our quiet time here when we're all isolated, reading books written by artists. Uh, watching TV and movies created by artists, um, and then journaling and, and writing and, uh, and painting and doing uh, creative projects at home um, as we're stuck in our houses. Uh, and what I realized then is that the arts may not be the first responders, but we are a balm and, uh, and a healing opportunity, and sometimes the distraction that we all need when we turn, uh, what we turn to in a crisis. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, no, I can't get to my next slide. Um, so just to start, uh, Santa Cruz County has an incredibly vibrant arts community. It's one of the things that's made, that makes this place such a special uh, place to live and work. Um, you might not know that we have the fifth highest concentration of artists of any community in the United States. 
And that means that the communities that have a higher concentration of artists are New York, Los Angeles, uh, San Francisco, large cities. Um, it really makes us a, a unique beast. Um, anyone who's read The Good Times knows that there is a constant stream of arts events happening on any given week. Um, and they range from symphonic concerts and Shakespeare plays, folklorico performances, and African drumming and dance classes. Uh, just looking at the nonprofit arts sector, the arts generate $40 million in economic activity. Uh, and that's just the nonprofit arts, not counting the for profit dance studios and art schools and businesses like the Catalyst that, uh, that, that generate more economic activity in our community. Um, it's interesting to know that the, uh, the longest serving nonprofit organization in our community is the, art, the Santa Cruz Art League, which celebrated its 100th anniversary last year. Over, uh, over the past few years, the Arts Council has served 48 different nonprofit arts organizations. Uh, and today, nearly all of them, like so many other businesses, have closed their doors. Uh, next slide, please. So the impact on co of COVID-19 on our local arts ecosystems has been enormous. Uh, arts events that typically gather dozens to hundreds of people together indoors have all been canceled, um, and that's for the foreseeable future. The results from the nonprofit survey that the Community Foundation conducted uh, showed that an estimate for losses uh, from just half of the groups, groups that the Arts Council funds um, over the next few months is likely to be around $2 million. Uh, some of our larger arts organizations do have the reserves to weather this crisis, at least in the short term, um, and some of them have been able to retain staff, but many others are furloughing and laying off their, uh, their, their, their staff. Some smaller arts, or arts organizations that pretty much always live very close to the financial edge are, are, are very close to closing their doors. Uh, and of course, many individual artists, and these are the original gig workers, uh, have largely lost their sources of, uh, of income from the arts. Uh, next slide. Oh, looks like, go ahead and uh, make all of those bullets appear if you would. Thank you. Um, in response to the crisis, uh, the Arts Council immediately began gathering resources, information resources, to help artists and organizations cope with the unprecedented drop in revenue. Uh, we were fortunate to receive a significant bequest from the estate of a, uh, of a longtime supporter of the Arts Council, and that allowed our board to dedicate $75,000 uh, in emergency relief grants. Uh, those, the applications for those funds are open now and we'll be awarding them between now and the end of April. Um, obviously, given the scale of the losses that we're facing, we clearly don't have enough to be able to make organizations whole. Um, but hopefully these funds will at least help us carry through and keep organizations solvent um, through the next few months while we try to develop additional resources to support organizations. Uh, we've also heard from many organizational leaders that they felt isolated since this began. So we've been conducting meetings like this, where we're pulling together leaders from arts organizations to have conversations like this, to share both their stories on a human level and the resources that they're learning about so that we can all be better informed. And we've also actively participated in state and federal advocacy efforts to ensure that the arts get included in the, uh, the various stimulus measures. Next slide. Thank you, you're on it. <laughs> oh, I know on the right slide, there we go. Um, there have been some bright spots and I think it's important that we make sure we share the bright spots in a time like this. Um, I really want to highlight the County Office of Education as well as our school district partners. Uh, they've made it possible for us to keep our teaching artists employed by making distance learning available, uh, making distance learning available for, for the arts, for, uh, for students learning from home. Um, that has led to the creation of a new website um, at the Arts Council uh, that really is a collection of all of these arts lessons plans. That, uh, that parents can do with their children at home. And that covers visual arts, theater, theater games, dance, as well as some music exercises. So, uh, so I encourage you to check that out, especially if you have young kids at home, but, uh, but these art projects are fun for adults as well. Um, 
You know, of course, many organizations, and we heard, uh, of course, Ferris talk about this, but many organizations are turning to, uh, to web-based programming and web-based resources. And I would say that that's a bright spot. If this had happened some years ago, we, uh, we would not have had that opportunity and that would, would create even more isolation and disconnection and loss of revenue as, uh, as some organizations are able to raise money through these, uh, these online, online platforms. Um, another bright spot is that I've experienced and heard from artists, but also other colleagues, despite the challenges and the isolation of this time, uh, the solitude and quiet are really creating an opportunity to be creative, um, to go in inside, and some of the most profound pro profound artistic creations are, uh, are developed in times like these. So I think, uh, I think, I hope that many of you are experiencing that and taking the time for yourselves to actually find the creativity and the solitude. Um, and the CARES Act, um, despite all of its challenges and its problems, still did make SBA loans available and accessible to nonprofits. I know that many, if not all, arts organizations plan to take advantage of these resources so long as they hold out. Um, and also that same act allocated $25 million to the NEA, which has already announced their emergency grant making. Um, and those funds should be, uh, will be applying, those fund, applying for those funds and re-granting those dollars to other arts organizations in the community. Um, as far as I understand, the grants will be made in July. Next slide, please. And of course, there are gaps in the resources available that we're trying to figure out how to fill. Um, we have very little by way of financial support for individual artists uh, who have lost their livelihoods. It's a, uh, it is a huge task and uh, some larger cities have, uh, have created funds for individual artists, but this is a small community and our cities and county don't have the same level of resources. And so that's, that's a, a much harder ask at this time of year. Um, also, uh, some funders and donors are pro prioritizing uh, the profound health and human service needs of our community. And that's completely appropriate, of course, but it does mean that there are fewer resources for the arts at a time like this. And I would say that the biggest challenge is that nobody really knows how this is all gonna unfold, both, uh, both from a public health perspective, but also from an economic perspective. That makes planning for your next event or your next performance or even your whole next season incredibly challenging. Um, the, you know, the question, when will we be safe to sit shoulder to shoulder in a, in a crowded theater? That's just a, a, a big challenge that we're all, uh, we're all grappling with. Uh, next slide. Oops. Oh, that seems odd. Is it missing? Yeah, it does appear to be. My my apologies, everybody. Um, I think that uh, I think that I just want to uh, to wrap up by uh, by saying that um, we're going to be there for the arts community um, and uh, and working to gather resources and make connections and stay connected so that uh, so that the arts can really be a participant in uh, in the healing of this community as we think about and move towards recovery. And I think I'll close there. Okay. Thank you, Jim. We really appreciate those comments. And I just also want to thank uh, both Jim and Ferris for the same kinds, the consistent concerns about equity on the steering committee for CORE. It's been a huge influence and a huge support for this work. So we have some questions for Jim coming through the chat. Nicole, do you want to capture a couple of those? Yeah. I um, see the chat while I was doing the slides. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so there are a couple questions and one reminder too about, um, so one question is about, Jim, do you know are arts organizations applying for some of those SBA loans? Um, and then the reminder is that the, that the County of Santa Cruz is actually hosting a webinar at three o'clock today um, to provide kind of an overview of how small businesses and nonprofits can access those funds. But Jim, do you have a sense, are you hearing from arts organizations whether they're trying and what they're experiencing? Almost every organization that I've spoken with is planning to apply or has already 
gotten in the queue, um, of course, the, it's, not a, it's not a quick process. And most of us have, uh, have filled out the paperwork to get in the queue, but we haven't, uh, haven't heard back from the loan officers. A couple have actually gotten through the application process. Yeah. And any thoughts or, again, kind of um, suggestions for all of us about other ways that we can support the arts community, especially knowing how, how significant the, the impact is on them? Yeah, I think the best thing you can do is, uh, is, is check out your local arts organizations, see what resources they're making available online. If you have the ability, um, make a donation to support their work. If, uh, if you bought tickets, I heard that Shakespeare announced they're, uh, they're uh, not going to do their season this year in, de in December. So if you bought tickets for Shakespeare, um, consider making those ticket prices that you already, uh, that you already purchased a donation. Mm -hmm. um, the, a lot of organizations are doing that. And um, consider, as organizations do announce their next season, consider subscribing um, if you feel mm -hmm. like you can safely do that. Great. Thank you. Other questions coming in? I think so. Those are some of the main ones about the arts, just kind of how our artists being su supported and hopefully not only sustained, but kind of can recover from all of this. Um, and so I, I think, so again, well, thanks, Harris. I'm seeing that um, he shared the link to his slides. Um, Jim will ask you if you can do the same. We'll start that Google Sheet with the question, the other questions that have been coming up in the chat that we weren't able to get to today. I love that idea of then in real time, Ferris and Jim, that you could help answer those. Um, but I think that we'll move to our closing now because we wanted to hear your thoughts, you know, again, just knowing that in times like this, there are a lot of bright spots that can happen. I love that phrase, Jim. Um, great examples of the creativity and innovation that can happen when we're when we're faced with crises like this and also really where that sometimes in these moments of crisis we can tend to react right and and even though we might have the best of intentions in terms of um, you know uh, reducing inequities or not causing further inequities that sometimes our own actions and decisions can actually have the opposite effect um, we, you know we've heard some stories from organizations about you know, being faced with hard choices um, and making uh, furloughs or, or layoff decisions. And oftentimes those decisions end up having a disproportionate impact on, you know, part-time workers or the lowest, you know, paid workers that just kind of exacerbate some of those inequities. And so we're just curious or asking you as, as leaders in your sectors, education, the arts, what, what would you want to say to other leaders in the education and arts about how to continue to advance equity, even in the midst of the crisis, especially in, a, in the midst of a crisis like this, so that when we're all ready to begin that um, rebuilding and, and healing process that we're, we haven't found ourselves taking, you know, 10 steps backwards. So. I, think, I think what I would say is that uh, this is a time when everything is changing. Um, and so as you're uh, on the fly changing all of the work that you do, now is the perfect time to begin thinking about and integrating equity into the work, knowing that the old systems are inherently, almost certainly inequitable. And uh, it, it seems like taking this opportunity of change to really deeply build equity into the systems that you create. We are, uh, we are looking for next year at completely reorganizing our grant making around recovery and uh, around recovery from this crisis. And as we do that, um, it's a, it feels like a perfect opportunity to integrate an equity lens into, uh, into the work that we do. So we make sure we're not perpetuating or replicating the inequities that have existed in the way that we functioned for many, many years. Great, thanks, Jim. How about you, Ferris? What are what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I think that uh, you know I also really appreciated uh, Jim's bright spots focus, and I think that I think that this crisis has really transformed our system in a lot of ways, and I think that it's going to have long term impacts. It could be real positive and has has lots of opportunities. Uh, I think that um, 
the short term, this this coming year and the year after that in education specifically, it's going to be there are going to be some lean years, and we are going to be having to prepare for 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 some of those. I think being able to apply some of the the learnings that we've we've been able to incorporate, like uh, transitioning to more of a hybrid approach to education for students, I think is real positive. I think that being able to um, figure out better ways to connect with our community and to really listen to the needs of our community as we're building our building our solutions and, and our opportunities for them. So I, I see both the challenges that we're going to continue to face and I also see many of the opportunities that, that, that are, are opening up as a result. The, the, the tightness uh, of the working relationship with our nonprofit agencies, with our county agencies, cities, um, of course our school districts, I think there is, there is a coalescing that is there and everybody is talking about equity, everybody is talking about our most vulnerable youth, everybody is really thinking about what, who is being left out of this conversation. And I think that that's going to really help us. I, I, I feel a, a commitment in this because I think it's, it's again, this, this experience has really exposed some of those, the, the, the extreme nature of, of how, these, how this, uh, this situation has, has really hurt and or impacted our, our most vulnerable families. And so I think there is an awareness there that is really going to be able to guide us and help us uh, build, build a a county and, a, and an environment that's much more supportive and responsive to, to our families. Thank you both. Why don't we, before we start moving to our wrap up, um, why don't we give a final opportunity if anyone wants to either ask a question in the chat, a burning question, or if anyone wants to raise your hand virtually, and we'll call on you to, to unmute your microphone to ask a final question to either Ferris or Jim. We have a few few minutes to do that if you want. And if you want to share resources with us, we are happy to share those with the whole group as well. So I'm just looking to see if anyone is raising their hand trying to get our attention. Um, so it looks like uh, don't have any hands raised. So we'll um, just move to our closing to say thank you so much again, Ferris and Jim, for um, sharing all this information with us today, uh, really helpful just to hear so clearly and, and concretely, you know, how uh, COVID-19 is affecting your, your, your sectors, your organizations, your partners, and how you're all within your own worlds kind of pulling together to, uh, to collectively respond. And again, hope that everyone here who's on the call today and that watches this afterwards, that we all view ourselves as part of the um, solution going forward and and Jim and Ferris hope you see all of us as as partners in that as well so thank you all for being here with us today we are trying to work on um, and actually we'll probably send out the registration email either later today or first thing Monday morning about our next coffee chat which we have scheduled we're hoping for the 14th of uh, next week from 10 to 11, where we'll actually have a couple of speakers talking about the process of applying for the Paycheck Protection Program and economic injury disaster uh, loans for nonprofits. So both some information, but also hopefully some guidance and tips for people that have tried and are running into some of those um, lags or challenges in terms of finding lenders who are accepting applications. So stay tuned for that information and Nicole Lezen has um, entered the URL for the feedback survey about today's coffee chat in the group chat box. Um, Zoom is, has turned off the feature that automatically turns URLs into hyperlinks for security reasons. So um, we're going to encourage you to copy and paste that link before you leave today's session It'll, and then open it up in a browser and fill it out. We'll also send it out in a follow-up email with the link to the recording. We've been recording all of these coffee chats and posting them on our core investments YouTube channel for anybody to watch later. So we'll, when we send out that link, we'll also send the link to the feedback survey. Because we do uh, value your feedback. We adjust our plans for, the, for these coffee chats based on feedback. Always looking for ideas about what you'd be interested in hearing about or talking about in future coffee chats as well. So I think with that, we are right at our closing time. Okay, well done. Thanks everyone, stay safe. And thank you, Ferris and Jim. Thank you. Thank you.